Hey everyone, my name is Nicole Coates and this is my video explaining experiment two and what I discovered. So like it said in the opening little video there, um, my question is, my question was, is there a relationship between percent coverage of macroalgae and population density of Butterina within the Rocky Intertidal? From this, I came up with the hypothesis that the greater percent coverage of macroalgae, the higher the density of snails will be. And then and my null hypothesis was that there is no relationship or no effect of percent coverage of macroalgae on the snail population density in the air, or in the Brocky intertidal, I should say. So to give you a little background on the rocky intertidal area and the Litorina species that live within it, um, so as we learned earlier in the course that the rocky intertidal, there is fierce competition. It is highly competitive to live here. The blue mussels are such effective colonizers, they regularly outcompete barnacles as well as the Litorina. Litorina species are herbivorous mollusks within the rocky intertidal. They are essentially, they are just they're snails, herbivorous snails, um, and they range in size. Anyway, so Litorina species generally prefer the intertidal and they're not, you won't usually find them in the subtidal or you won't find large populations of them within the subtidal. This is because they like the shallow, warmer tide pools than they do the rough, often highway stress environments of the subtitle. So Litorina, as I said before, are herbivorous. They enjoy feeding on the macroalgae within the rocky intertidal and their main um, Main predators are the dog whelks, which are another mollusk that live within the rocky intertidal, and are another snail. Alright, so now I want to talk a little bit more about the methods of my experiment. So what I did is I chose two different locations. I had one sheltered location, which was Dobbins Cove, and a, another location that was more exposed um, at Herring Cove. So Dobbins Cove, if you don't know, is located essentially between Peggy's Cove and Cranberry Cove. If you drive from Halifax to Peggy's Cove, there is a small parking lot off the highway that you can park in, and there is a trail leading just off the highway into Dobbins Cove. Dobbins Cove has a high population of macroalgae, um, lots of Ascophyllum nodosum, lots of different fucus species, um, if you end up finding yourself in the drainage channel, you can find Coralinas, you can find some Caucus Crispus. Uh, there's also uh, Cato Morva that I found there before. I definitely recommend checking it out uh, if you ever get the chance to. So when I got to Dobbins, what I did is I laid a transect line in the higher to tidal, which ended up leading into one of the drainage channels. And I placed three quadrats along the transect. Now, since I was specifically selecting for percent coverage of macroalgae, my quadrats were not placed randomly. So while in the field, I kind of eyeballed the percent coverage of my quadrats. So I had a control, which was less than 15% coverage a treatment one, which was between 15% and 65% coverage, and a treatment two, which is greater than 65% coverage. From those three, I then counted each of the individual snails in the quadrat. Um, it is possible that I encountered some counting errors. Take that out. Don't talk about that yet. Oh my god. So I did a second transect then within the low to mid intertidal range 
Uh, getting to the low winter tidal at Dobbins Cove is quite tricky because it is on the outside of the rocks where the way it, where there's quite a lot more wave stress, it's quite more exposed. So I opted for the mid winter tidal at Dobbins. And again, I laid my 30 meter transect line and laid three quadrants long. Again, a control with less than 15, a treatment blend between 15 and 65% coverage, and a treatment two with greater than 65% coverage. And then again, counted each of the individual snails within each quadrant. I repeated this same method and procedure again at Herring Cove Provincial Park. Heron Cove is an exposed site. There is nothing to protect it, so it is very exposed, but there are several tide holes that I was able to find and work with the Littorina species within those. So again, I got laid one transact in the high intertidal and another in the low intertidal and counted each of the individual species in my control, treatment one, treatment two, for each of the transects, resulting in six sets of data from each location. So for each of my control, treatment one and treatment two, I have four sets of data. Once I made my way back home, I uploaded my data into Excel or inputted my data into Excel, I should say, and calculated the average populations, average population size, for each of my control treatment one, treatment two, and then the average density of each of those treatments. From that, I also calculated average percent cover for each of the treatments, and I used this data to, to conduct a two-way ANOVA, uh, giving me a p-value. My p-value is So my p-value from running the ANOVA was 0 0.16, which is, result, gives me a non-significant p-value, which I will interpret later. I also graphed the uh, percent coverage of macroalgae against the density of the snail population, which I will show here. And what generally can be inferred from this is that the density of the control group and treatment one relative or sorry treatment two i should say relatively appear to be the same they are very similar whereas the population density of littorina at treatment one is slightly lower so now i'd like to move on and talk a little bit more on my discussion and what do these results mean essentially so since my p-value was greater than 0.05, I then failed to reject my null hypothesis, stating that there is no effect of percent coverage on the population abundance of, or sorry, the population density of Littorina within the rock meter title. This um, rejection, or this failing of to reject my null hypothesis is in direct contrast with the findings of a paper by Cardoso et al. done in 2017, where they studied the uh, relationship between Littorina grazers and Ascophyllum nodosum. So what they found was that there is a positive relationship between Littorina grazers of several species and Ascophyllum nodosum within the rocky intertidal. And this led, this suggests significant results between percent coverage and uh, population density of Littorina species. My experiment was quite limited in the data sets that I had. I believe that if I had done more replications, if I had more sets of data, I might have gotten different results. Uh, it also would have been interesting to um, to dive more into the relationship between Littorina species and Ascophyllum nodosum specifically, and to do more uh, research into that. So maybe compare um, Littorina species in 
Ascophyllum populations and maybe another in like Fucus fasciculosus populations and go about it that way. I think that would have been a really, that would be a really interesting question to explore. So what I also found, what I also um, noticed while I was at these two locations is that at Dobbins Cove, which was a sheltered location, there is very little blue mussels, at least that I saw and which is in direct contrast to the population of blue mussels at Herring Cove. At Herring Cove there was an abundance of blue mussels at almost every tide pool I went to and very little little rhino in the population especially in the low intertidal area and I found that really interesting because it shows the um, the colonization and the ability of the blue mussels to outcompete uh, other grazers, so littorina and barnacles. Whereas at Dobbins, there was no blue mussels, so barnacles and littorina were able to establish themselves as grazers within that ecosystem. Some other source of error that could as long with the not enough replications would have been in my counting. I wasn't marking the snails as I was counting, so it's possible that I miscounted, whether counting a certain snail twice or missing one completely. While I was laying my quadrats, I tried to avoid areas that say had like a crevice or that was particularly deep. That would be harder for me to count each individual snail as I didn't want to disturb any of the snail population around the quadrat. So it's possible that I miscounted in that sense. And again, I would love to have more replications. Um, I, like I said, I think um, testing the specific relationship between Litorina species and Ascophyllum nodosum and Litorina and um, other macroalgae species such as um, Fucus fasciculosus would be an interesting question to explore as well as anything involving aquaculture because the macroalgae aquaculture is quite large off the coast of Nova Scotia so how is this harvesting of specifically Ascophyllum nodosum affecting the little rhinos, like their little rhino populations off the coast. Um, some final conclusions that I would like to make are that the, uh, that my results were non-significant, but that doesn't mean that there is no relationship. It just means that more research needs to be done. More studies need to be done to determine this relationship between uh, percent coverage of microalgae and litorina um, population densities in the rocky intertidal. Um, again, it was a very small sample size experiment and I think, feel like more data is required to be able to determine if there are significant results or not. Um, in, the eye, in the wave 2 I've seen with the Mi'kmaq people I think that between aquaculture and um, the specific relationship between Ascophyllum nodosa and the Lenorina snails is that we just need to be conscious of where we're harvesting, how much we're harvesting, and how that may affect the, herbivor the herbivores in the area. And specifically, the snails that are often outcompeted by the mussels. That is all I have to say on my experiment too. I hope you guys enjoyed my findings and found them interesting. If you have any questions, feel make sure to leave them below and I will answer them.